millions of dollars into investing into research to identify the most efficient animals. So the animals that consume less than the other animals in the barn while maintaining their level of production. And so by combining all those together in that one straw of sex semen, a producer can easily make progress in all of those traits by doing something they were already doing, right? Breeding their animals. Swallet. I'm your host, Trey Kellner, and today I'm joined by a duo. We have Clint Schwab, the Vice President of Technology and Customer Success at AccuFast, and Jocelyn Johnson, a research scientist at ST Genetics. Welcome, Jocelyn and Clint. How are you doing today? Doing well. Doing good. Thanks for having us. Good, good. Since we have two, we're going to go back and forth here. So, Clint, why don't you first introduce yourself to our audience? Uh, sure. Um, again, my name is Clint Schwab. I'm originally from, from Colorado, um, but ended up in Texas by way of, well, several different moves in my career. But I've always been really at the center of, you know, of genetic improvement programs. Um, did my master's and PhD in, in animal breeding at Iowa State. Um, then went from there and spent some time at the National Swine Registry, then ultimately spent a decade at, uh, at the Mashoffs, um, was transitioned to Mashoffs to build um, their own internal genetics program that then you may know as became Acuity um, and developed into an external facing genetics program that then was in 2022 uh, acquired by, by ST Genetics. And now I live in Texas and work with part of the ST family of businesses. So, yeah, along the way, because I'm a glutton for punishment, along the way, I went back and got my my MBA because of an interest in more of the business side of things. And so, yeah. Now, yeah, awesome. Uh, Jocelyn, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yep. As you said, I'm Jocelyn Johnson, and I kind of work on the ST genetic side of the business. My background is in ruminant nutrition and all things kind of livestock efficiency. And so at ST, I, I came in to help manage a, our eco feed program, which is feed efficiency on on the beef and dairy side of things. And I also contribute to our beef on dairy programs and kind of manage a lot of our sustainability discussions. Awesome. And I don't have the the big swine background here, so I'm a little bit out of my you know normal circle. But I did grow up showing pigs, so, you know, I know what it's like to smell like a pig for the rest of the day. Awesome. Well, we won't quiz you too hard, right? Um, (laughs) Meet AccuFast, your trusted partner in raising efficient, healthy, and sustainable pork. We're not just about genetics. We're about tailored solutions that set you on your path to success, no matter how you define it. At AccuFast, we channel our investments into three crucial pillars, our genetic offering, proprietary technology platform, and leading commercial measurement system, ensuring tangible results for our partners. Visit our website at AccuFastSwine.com or reach out to an AccuFast customer success rep to discuss how we can help you create the future you've been working towards. AccuFast, the best way to predict the future is to create it. I think, Clint, where I want to start off with this conversation is, is as you alluded to, right, ST Genetics and AccuFast is kind of this multi-species um, genetics company, and that provides some advantages. So, Clint, you just kind of want to give a, a brief overview of, of what, you know, what the business is like, what you're trying to achieve with your customer success. Yeah, you bet. So by, by way of background, I don't know how many of, are familiar with, or at least to how I was, right? Early on in my career, I wasn't as familiar with ST genetics, um, at least within the swine realm. And so um, ST, and I know that Jocelyn will go into uh, the, a lot more of this in detail, but is today is uh, the sixth largest um, genetics company in the globe. Um, and they've grown super fast, um, started obviously, as Jocelyn will talk about, in, largely in cattle. Um, now today in dairy and beef cattle. And in t- along the way, in 2015, um, ST bought Fast Genetics. And so that was kind of their segue into a multi-species um, platform, particularly around just in, from bovine into porcine. 
And then as we talked about in 2022, um, included Acuity into that platform. And so today, AccuFast is essentially the merger of Fast and Acuity, um, and those two teams, those two genetic programs. And so as part of my career, right, is uh, the being involved in a commercial pork production system, you know, it's you, you get a perspective of, you know, what's important to a commercial pork producer. But I didn't have a whole bunch of exposure to a multi-species platform and what that offers the independent business units, whether it's the beef cattle or dairy cattle genetics operations that Jocelyn will talk about, or in this case, AccuFast, that's the porcine business segment for for ST. So there's a multiple of things that we can talk about, Rob, probably throughout the course of the conversation here. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's a broader set of perspectives that you get to leverage, right? That ST has a huge history and development of innovative, you know, tools and a largely an entrepreneur type of atmosphere. And so there's a lot of learnings that comes from that. But, you know, you think automatically about larger systems, you get to leverage a lot of the the shared service investments and so forth. Those are the, I would call like the easier elements that add efficiency. But, you know, the breeder's equation when you're trying to improve genetics is the same regardless of what species you're talking about. So, a lot of the tools that we use, whether it's bioinformatics or genomics, they're ubiquitous to species, right? So you can develop those faster across species, ultimately create a, a better ROIC because you leverage those investments across multiple species. So it, it's, it's enabled us to, I would argue, within AccuFast, even in the last two years, speed the rate of progress up just by virtue of the ability to leverage the different perspectives and you know, the broader set of resources in, in a lot of different areas. Yeah, that's awesome. Jocelyn, you know, as, as being on the beef side, you know, have you seen pros with, with adding, you know, more swine geneticists to your team? Absolutely. I think there's just a lot of synergies, right? I mean, we know that the industries are, are obviously vastly different in some forms and functions, but like you said, there's so much overlap and and the goals of, you know, improving genetics and providing technologies and management tools into the industries. And so it's been nice to open up, you know, even just the number of people and access that we have to different brains and how they think, um, but also to, to more data and um, kind of sharing of paths and technologies has been exciting to see. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for that overview and, and kind of the advantages um, of your your current partnership, right, in the current structure. So, Jocelyn, we were talking about before the call um, about, you know, things that are happening within the beef industry and, and kind of want to start here with sustainability, right? Sustainability is a word that's on every agriculture podcast and in every, you know, conference we go to, whether it's genetics, nutrition, management, you know, production, it gets brought up. And it's not a new concept, right? But it, it's something that we're trying to figure out and get a hold of. So, Jocelyn, just kind of start, what does sustainability mean within your current role and how are you helping your customers be more sustainable? Yeah, so, I mean, I like that you mentioned, right, this isn't a new concept. Um, you know, the the animal protein industries have had to be sustainable and continue to, to become more sustainable. And so I think to, to us, what that definition is, is that we're trying to create products to meet the consumer demand. So that's high quality products that are, you know, growing in quantities with the population size and doing it as efficiently and profitable as, as we can, right? We want to use our resources well. We continually have growing competition for land, water, resources, feed, etc. And so not only from just our own stewardship, but also from, you know, a lack of more resources becoming available. We have to create an industry that can make more using less in order to continue to supply the globe with all of the, you know, the high protein products that we need to sustain. And, and so in my role specifically, you know, I'm on the kind of beef and dairy genetic side of things where we're trying to create animals that are going to be the most sustainable um, to help drive the same idea of practice, right? So those animals are going to be animals that are 
highly productive, that have the ability to produce the products we need at the quality we need, but that are also doing it using less feed resources, specifically with like our eco feed program, um, but also just in general of uh, um, space availability, welfare, health, right? We need animals that are healthy, happy, and working well to be able to have in our production systems. And so we'll kind of talk through the podcast about different areas of this, but really it all starts with that genetic base and then adding technologies and management techniques that we can help provide to our customers to get them to be the most efficient, sustainable, you know, both from an environment, you know, the big hot topic of greenhouse gas emissions perspective, but also that they're profitable and they can transfer their farm to the next generation to continue, you know, creating the products that our consumers want. Yeah. Uh, Clint, from the swine side in your role, um, what additions would you have or differences that you may have um, than what Jocelyn just spoke about? So it centers a little bit back to what I was talking about before. I, I really don't think it's much different, to be honest. I, mm-hmm. I think that the, the mindset or the approach is, whether you think about it in terms of pigs, dairy, or beef cattle, it's this, the same approach, right? We're going to try to improve the, the animal as one piece of it, right? There's the people element to sustainability in that definition. And then ultimately the environment and greenhouse gases, that stuff that Jocelyn talked about, right? But underpinning all of that is there has to be an element of sustainable profit to be able to take this and transcend generations, right? And be able to do it on the, on the long term. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to do a very big Google search to find out where all the, you know, the improvements that the industries have made, right? We've made huge improvements in some of those things. The shift in my view, and I I think Jocelyn would echo this on the bovine side, that the shift in mindset has largely been from doing what we generally do every year in improving animals to now we've done, we're doing a little better job of actually documenting what we've done in the past, the impact that these programs have had, whether it's a genetic improvement program or management styles or, or whatever that may be, right? To now thinking a little bit more about Okay, how do we identify those areas that makes those three buckets that we just mentioned better and better year over year, right? And that's where you get into, you can just think about it's multidisciplinary. There's just lots of different things that create all kinds of different intersections and places for us to sharpen our pencil. Yeah, for sure. I I think, you know, one reminder that I had as you guys were were talking and, and giving great answers is, you know, sustainability and profitability can be highly correlated right? You find me the most efficient animal or the sow that has the greatest, you know, PSY per year, you know, the cow that, you know, is, is, you know, the most efficient with her resources and has the best weaning weight and gives you a calf, you know, every year, you know, not only is that profitability to the producer, but that animal is highly sustainable, right? So in terms of the resources that she's using and then our output back. Um, so that's awesome. So, so Jocelyn, let's go a little bit on a background of what AST is currently doing around some of these initiatives, right? So I did a little bit of background research because I, I am a, a swine guy through and through. So I did learn that basically ST Genetics started as a sex semen company. I'm assuming it's become, there's, you know, a million different tools past this. So you want to go through those a little bit for us and, and how it uh, helps your customers be more profitable and more sustainable as well. Yeah, but I think, I mean, even what you were saying earlier, right, that sustainability and profitability really can can form together well mm-hmm. as one, right? Um, and I think a lot of times maybe we get pushback from the consumer end or maybe, you know, sometimes it's just a few loud voices in the room that are saying, you know, this industry may be greedy or we're not good for the environment. But, but the truth is that all these goals align um, and what we're trying to to get done and accomplished. And so from ST's perspective, I think we really, you know, our mission statement for ST is to lead global transformation in the production of more efficient, healthy, and that environmentally responsible food animal protein. And so we're trying to accomplish that by providing our customers with what they need to essentially feed the world more sustainably, right? And we've already talked about all those things. And 
like you said, you know, it all started kind of as a sex semen company, right? Acquiring that licensing from XY and really just the visionary of, you know, the CEO and investors within ST that they really were able to look out in the industry and say, you know, this technology, maybe today is not that great. People are very skeptical and don't think that this is going to have any impact. But if we can get this technology to a point where it's efficient and effective and can create, you know, that specified gender that we're looking for, it really can be a a game changer in how we are able to make not only genetic progress, but then also all of these other endpoints like defundary that we talk about today. And so just to kind of give a brief overview, essentially, if we started that straw of sex semen, we are providing, you know, the highest quality genetics for production, um, health, well-being, welfare, you know, those types of longevity traits, but also within ST specifically in the program I'm managing, we have put in, you know, millions of dollars into investing into research to identify the most efficient animals. So the animals that consume less than the other animals in the barn while maintaining their level of production. And so by combining all those together in that one straw of sex semen, a producer can easily make progress in all of those traits by doing something they were already doing, right? Breeding their animals. But now with sex semen being as effective as it is, they only really need about 35% of their herd to create the female replacements in a dairy that, that they need. And so 70% of the semen that we actually sell now is generally on the beef side. So being able to utilize beef genetics into those females that maybe are lower genetic value that we don't want to create the replacements out of. And by doing that, we've immediately created a terminal animal that already existed before as a Holstein bull calf. But today is an animal that's more efficient grows faster, has better quality carcasses, and also just like we talked about, more profitability and a lower carbon footprint. And then we can take that same sexing technology and apply it to that beef mating and transform it from a heifer to a terminal steer calf. And we know that we get even more efficiency gains and growth from that. And so just within that sorting technology, it's opened up a huge opportunity for improving profit and management on a farm, but also in that sustainability message for, you know, the carbon output and so forth. And then in more recent years, we've acquired a genetic testing lab that just then takes it to the next level to where now the, you know, the 35% of females that we're breeding this sex semen to, we can actually look at their genomics and, and know that they are in fact the best females. We can do the same thing on the terminal calf side. Um, you know, and on our young sire side so that we can make that genetic progress faster. And we can also identify, you know, different haplotypes and things that may lead to, you know, death early on or problems throughout that animal's lifetime to kind of answer also that social and, and welfare dynamic within the sustainability message. And then even more recently acquiring kind of a, a more bolus technology that we call farm fit and management platform that's enabling us to better and more effectively treat animals, track that medical usage, track that animal's temperature, behavior, um, and alerts and stuff to improve our breeding practices as well. And so just kind of combining all of that into a whole package that we're able to to really come alongside the producer. And we're not just selling them semen anymore. You know, we are really um, kind of coming alongside of them and, and working with them to try to improve that sustainability message on their farm. Awesome. Thanks, Jocelyn. So Clint, once again, we'll kind of do a reset here. I'll allow you to start big picture and then dive into sp- specific tools, right, that we can provide for producers. So not to date myself too much, but within my lifetime, Clint, most of the selection was done on a phenotypic basis, Right. Now we've gone to, we have the entire genome map and we're talking about, you know, splicing and slicing and snipping genes, you know, to make a a more sustainable or more efficient or more productive product, right? So, so Clint, kind of talk about your career and, you know, tools that have come to the market that have allowed us to be more successful within our selection. 
And then what does AccuFast currently have today within their portfolio to help? And then what do you think might come out in five to 10 years uh, that you're really excited about? Yeah. You said a lot there. So Sorry, Clint. <laughs> On a, on a couple of these, but um, you are right that they, the, the genetic tools, right, the technology that's that's been alongside of all of this, these improvement programs have have accelerated really fast. Um, and what we talk about today in terms of that toolbox um, is completely different than even when I was in graduate school. Um, when I was in graduate school, I learned techniques that were that are largely obsolete today, right? And those things are evolving at a really really fast pace to the point now where to Jocelyn's point earlier, we can understand the underpinning of and the genetic architecture of various traits and how they're expressed way differently than what we did before with, you referenced phenotypic selection, where there's, it's more of, it's a, a lot more guesswork than what we do today, mm -hmm. right? So when you peel apart some of that guesswork and you get down to specific elements, haplotypes to where they're actually transmitted and expressed it within the within the, the system is what we're able to do in genetic improvement programs that we couldn't do before right you take that extra specificity and you combine that with what i would argue is probably our our one of our biggest core assets and that's data right to help us make some of those decisions to where we get some of this information that not only at the nucleus level at the very top of the pyramid where we used to do the phenotypic selection that you referenced to now we're tracking and tracing those portions of the genome all the way through to the crossbred level. And hopefully we get to the point where if we're doing this podcast a year or two years from now, we're starting to talk about how does that influence the consumer products, right? Mm -hmm. Even further through that, through that value chain. So all of that is bundled together into, into those solutions that Jocelyn talked about, those genetic solutions. And it can come in the form of, you know, it could come in the form of, an animal that's that's used within a genetic system, a sire or a dam, or it can be in the in a very specified dose of semen, and that can be even gender skewed, for example, right? So the the solutions that we that we offer within AccuFast, I think you you asked me to talk about that, is really in principle not much different than what Jocelyn said. It's just the difference is is a pork production system is organized and set up in a slightly different way than beef cattle or dairy, right? So Jocelyn referenced like the beef on dairy program that that I would argue ST has helped facilitate in the industry with a lot of their tools that they've had is not any different in principle than what AccuFast does with their commercial test herd. It's a, it's a very similar thing where you make sure that that boar you're selecting to, and I'm going to draw this back to, you know, the phenotypic selection that you talked about before at the nucleus level, that Duroc boar, now we actually select him based upon what we more reliably predict his crossbred progeny to, to do, which is mm -hmm. a ton more valuable than it was a decade ago when we weren't using those kind of technologies. We make that more accurate by understanding this, the, in a lot of cases, subtle differences at the genome level between those individual bores and how it's going to be transmitted. So, the, the tools and things that AccuFast would bring to the market, very similar type of approach as what ST on the bovine side of things are just formatted a little bit different to fit that value chain. That makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, thanks. So, Jocelyn, what are you most excited about or what new items um, are you looking forward to bring um, throughout 2024? Yeah, so I think we've seen like a really exciting shift in this past year, you know, in, in previous years when we would bring up this topic of, you know, sustainability, a lot of times there would just be an instant, like you could feel the tension in the room shift, you know, to like, we are sustainable, like, why, why do we need to talk about this? But the conversation is, is opened a lot. And I think that that people are realizing that we can start to kind of take hold of this message and, and educate better on all the things that we are doing now that, that are great, but that, wow, there really are all these tools and technologies that we haven't fully tapped into um, that may help us as producers, you know? And so kind of excited to see that shift happening. And I think it'll enable a lot of change in the industry in general. You know, we don't have a lot of government regulations today, but you know, the top three shareholders 
in the meat and milk business all have science-based initiatives to reduce carbon. And so even if we don't want to talk about the conversation, like between them and the corporations, right, we have regulations unofficially (laughs) into how we're going to produce meat and milk in the future. And um, being able to see that come down maybe as a more positive message than in the past and, and being able to see that you know, like our technologies, like EcoFeed, that we can create animals that have a lower carbon footprint and that save producers on feed costs and that, you know, are still as productive in creating the high quality products we need. And so I think what we're excited to do is, you know, continue to drive the research efforts and um, feed efficiency and profitability and things on the terminal animal side, but also in some new things like heat tolerance and other welfare type issues that that producers face. And also trying to open up more markets that producers may be able to tap into, um, whether it be more integrated supply chain type situations, you know, um, or just being in the carbon credit market where our producers can start to get some incentives, you know, in the more short term on, I did this and I'm I'm contributing to this effort. And so being able to capture some of that incentive, I think will be all exciting things that we'll get to kind of see come to fruition in the next year. Yeah. Hey, Clint, anything to add that you're excited about this year for AccuFast in 24? Uh, you make it easy on me because I get to just piggyback on what Jocelyn said throughout the course of this, right? She's, and that's all, that's, that's what I'll do here, right? It's, it's doing a, better at what we're good at and what we've done already in the past, right? So what Jocelyn has has kind of alluded to is that the sustainability efforts from a genetic improvement side of things, the programs and platforms have been, uh, I mean, would argue on the, a lot of the basic level traits so far. You know, if you, in, in a pig production system, if you make more pigs, right, litter size, and you improve just essentially lean growth rate, you've got a big chunk of the equation of Mm -hmm. from a sustainability standpoint. But what the opportunities that have started to evolve over the last few years that I hope in the next, that we'll we'll see in the next year or two start to come about is like a new frontier on how we define some of those things, right? It's not just the number of wean pigs out the door. It's how did we create those wean pigs with a sow that's more user-friendly, a sow that does a better job in terms of her lifetime productivity. Right. And to get the same output in a more sustainable format that gives us the next gear. Right. On the wean to market side, it's it's like finding those those pigs that fit their environment, the fitness traits and it can help us on survival and then ultimately get us to meet quality parameters and all the other elements that are kind of underneath the surface of of lean growth rate and PSY, as we tend to talk about a lot in the pig side of things. So I I envision a lot of those things starting to materialize that ultimately makes customers, our business partners, I mean, can help them with their sustainability efforts because they get a better outcome as a result. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just want to highlight two things that both of you said um, and combine those answers just a little bit, because I think it's a good message for our podcast listeners. A, sustainability, we do not have to be defensive about it. When, we, when I talk about being a swine nutritionist, Jocelyn, when you talk about being a geneticist, Clint, when you talk about being a geneticist, those two occupations are all about trying to improve efficiencies and livability and um, minimize excretion, right? And those are all part of the sustainability equation and profitability, right, for for our, our customers and clients. And that should be a very positive message, right? When we, when I, at least I talk to, right, non-agriculture, you know, friends and stuff like that, they're, they're just fascinated on, on how positive a message that is within, you know, just my own particular role. And I'm sure you guys have the exact same conversation. So, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because I thought those were two really good answers and, and thank you for them. Um, anything that we should cover about ST or AccuFast, Jocelyn, that we missed before we move on to some, some funner questions or at least some more entertaining questions for me? How about that? I don't think anything too big. I, I hope that maybe this podcast gleamed a little light into those that may not be as familiar with ST and that, you know, we really aren't a sex semen company anymore. It really is a technology, data, and research driven um, company that's really hitting a lot of the aspects within our production systems. And so I think 
you know, some people still don't realize how far we've come from just sorting that straw of semen, but it's always interesting and fun to, to share all the things we're doing. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for that, Jocelyn. All right. You ready for some, some questions? So a little bit for our listeners, how the sausage is made. We are recording this the Friday before Super Bowl Sunday. So I'm not going to be really mean and ask our guests to give the predictions as this episode comes out a month or two later. We find out if they were really smart or really wrong. But what I will ask, and I'll start with Clint, what's your favorite Super Bowl food? Ooh. Really good question. I'd probably just say nachos, probably. But, I, you know, there's pro- there's not very many. Well, I probably would have went to beverages first, but we'll stick to <laughs> We'll, we'll stick to food. There's not very many of them on, on Super Bowl Sunday that I don't like. So, Same. Jocelyn, do you have a favorite Super Bowl food that you, you want to be at any gathering that you're at? Man, I don't know that we can go without, you know, having a good chips and queso there. But, but like you said, there's <laughs> the, the fun part about Super Bowl, right, is that there's so many good options. Yes. And my family's, a, my husband's a diehard Chiefs fan, so I have to put my prediction in that the Chiefs will win the, the Super Bowl again here. Yeah, well, since you brought it up, I grew up in Kansas. I'm a diehard Chiefs fan, too, so I will I will put in a prediction for the Chiefs winning as well. I, I hope that comes true and we look really, really smart. So There you go. So I'm an yeah. Iowa State grad, so yeah, I'm, I have to I have to vote for Brock, Brock Purdy. Yeah, well, there we go. We, we have a committee split, That'd right? Somebody, so we'll, you know? we'll, see, we'll see when this airs who is right and who is wrong. A worldwide leader in animal nutrition. Adiseo's portfolio of products includes methionine, the full range of vitamins, enzymes, organic selenium, probiotics, mycotoxin management strategies, and palatability products. With such a diverse offering, Adiseo supports its customers with a broad range of expertise, tools, and services to help them maintain a competitive advantage. Adiseo, fueling predictable profits. To learn more, visit Adiseo at www.adiseo.com. Jocelyn, on a more serious note, what's the biggest hurdle you've overcome within your career that you're the most proud of? I think just seeing the transformation and and where people are at in the message. So, I mean, feed efficiency, you know, SU was investing in it over 10 years ago, but it's really been a taboo word that a lot of people didn't understand. You know, we have become so much more feed efficient. Well, why do... Like, what do we need to do different? And just understanding that there's things that we can select for that we haven't selected for in the past. And so I think some sometimes just that perception, you know, fighting that old perception, you know, that some people it's hard. We really are in a new space, you know, like genomics and cattle was what, 2009 mm-hmm. <laughs> is when it started. So we really are in a new era with a lot of new things. And sometimes that can be hard to translate into an old generation of, you know. Yeah. Clint, what's the biggest hurdle you've overcome in your career that you're the most proud of to put you on the spot? I face hurdles every day. Um, it seems like um, probably the biggest one that I would say, I would generalize this and say just the transition from, you know, graduating with, you know, with a PhD and being very scientific minded and more into the details to to more of uh, looking at things from a broader perspective and working through others and teams and so forth. And a little bit to tie into what Jocelyn said of, you know, don't anchor yourself so tightly to the past and how things were done um, to be open enough to what what may come down the road. So those are kind of the challenges that probably not just one time, but several times throughout my career I've had to, had to work with. Yeah. All right. And last question, Clint, I'll start with you. If if you had a magic wand and could fix one issue, I'll stay within swine, right? Within our swine industry, which issue would you fix first? I would grow pork demand. Mm. Yeah. And it, it would probably be, and I'd, I'd, not to offend Jocelyn, but to be able to take some of that market share from beef <laughs> and and grow it um, as as a proportion, I think that would just enable so many other opportunities for a lot of people in the industry if we grow, grow the demand. 
Yeah, great answer. You couldn't just agree to take it from chicken. <laughs> I could have. Yeah, it just, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll snip that out. We'll amend it. Yeah, take it from chicken, right? <laughs> Jocelyn. So we don't love the chicken. Yes, same question. Even though I probably am going to eat a lot of chicken wings um, this upcoming Sunday, that that will happen for sure. Jocelyn, same question. If you had a magic wand and you could fix one issue about the beef industry um, today, which would you pick? I think this is such a loaded question. Even though I got longer to think about it, it's, <laughs> it's still hard to to answer. But I think just the you know, the negative perception that it has into the consumer, like Mm. being able, you know, what was it a couple years ago that they had a vegan meal, you know, to support climate change or whatnot, even though they were there flying on their private jets, it would just be really nice to not be met with all of the instant climate critics um, when it comes to livestock production and our ruminant animals. So I guess that would be Oh, that's an outstanding answer and couldn't agree more. So Jocelyn Clint, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed the discussion and I'm sure our listeners will too. So with that, that concludes another episode of the Swine It podcast. We have new podcasts every week and hope you check them out on a regular basis. Hope you have a great day, friends.